Can't think of a third word that rhymes with that. So a seat and a sheet. Get off your feet. Anyhow, uh, I want to get started because I want to squeeze every minute I can out of the 45 that I don't always take, right? Maybe the 50. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, praise you for the gift of your church. I thank you for your word and, and for the, the work that, uh, that it took to to, uh, to, to bring it together, to, to be able to distribute it. It still goes out today and it still changes eternity today. Uh, so Lord, may we not only uh, relish the word, but may we be fueled by it and, uh, and sent through it. Uh, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Uh, just a reminder for our, uh, our funds that we continue to gather on uh, Sunday mornings uh, up here. Uh, please frequent that as often as you can. Uh, any uh, announcements today? Any announcements that we need to pay attention to for today? Thank you. Any guests today that we would like to highlight? Right? Yes. That is, well, go ahead. Yeah, introduce yourself. I wanted to see where I'm back, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I did not buy my wedding ring. I lost my wedding ring yesterday. Oh. So be on the lookout. Yeah. yeah be yeah, on the lookout. First one is even when, when I was in uh, Webster Gardens in St. Louis, uh, dear sister was a member there. So when she walks in, I'm kind of like going, hey, that's out, of, that's out of place. And yet, it's the right place. So you know what? You were the reason why we joined. <laughs> and then you laughed. Uh, <laughs> that's always fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're going to stop. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right. So uh, today is actually going to be the last of our study on the life of Christ according to Luke. Uh, and so next week, I'm going to start a brand new study uh, that's really just called apologetics. And apologetics is a kind of a fancy word uh, for, uh, again, uh, the, uh, the meaning, speaking and defending Scripture. And so I want to kind of teach us how. I, I thought it was a good time for that. We've been doing it, by the way. It's not something that you're not familiar with. Uh, but I think it's, it's important for us as we dive into Scripture and we learn it, we become more familiar with it, then what? Right? It's kind of like somebody buys you a Leatherman. Right, guys, uh, ladies, you might know what a Leatherman is too. Uh, one of those multi-tools, right? And you just keep it in the sheath, right? Carry it around on your belt just in case. Uh, Leatherman is a tool meant to be used. It's like the Swiss Army knife, right? And, uh, and so what we learn in the Bible is meant to be used, not just tucked away and go, man, I know a lot. Right? Or I, I know more, more comfortable with the Lord and, and what He teaches. So I want to uh, be able to take that a little bit further. So we're going to talk next week. We'll start about it. You guys are so consistent in Bible class. I think I could teach engine maintenance and you guys would show up. <laughs> I appreciate you guys. That's, uh, that's awesome. Uh, by the way, we won't be having that class. <laughs> That'd be about 20 minutes from me, right? It's, yeah, I could change a spark plug and oil and put air in a tire, I think, at this point. But um, anyhow, so um, in, your, uh, in front of you, have a Bible open. The interesting thing is we're going to be only looking at one chapter, essentially, today. And uh, we're looking at really the sixth um, uh, part of Luke in our study, and that's the resurrection. Everything right now, uh, our confirmands are uh, across the way in the blue room, and uh, and I'm teaching them right now. I always teach them uh, simultaneously, uh, although I'm on a screen over there, and uh, that's what today is all about. Over there for them is the resurrection. Everything comes down to the resurrection. Everything. Um, we are the only religion, the only religion in the entire world in the history of the world, uh, where the resting place of our leader is empty. Every other religion. You go to Buddha's uh, temple where he is buried, he's there, right? Uh, you go to Joseph Smith, he's there, right? Uh, you go to any number of religious leaders, they're still there. Ours is empty, wherever that happens to be. We're not actually sure where the tomb is, uh, but it's empty. And, uh, and so everything that Jesus accomplishes in salvation comes down to this event, this miraculous moment uh, of where he single-handedly at one moment defeats everything that plagues us. It was that moment. Now, a lot of things built up to it. A lot of things demonstrated that and so forth. But it was that moment. It was definitive, an exclamation point in history uh, to be able to say this is the moment where everything changed. Now, people in the Old Testament, they're saved because they believe that the Savior was going to come. We are saved because we believe that he came. And there are people that we're going to tell they're going to be saved because they believe he will come again. Right, And so we see that and we will digest that today. So if you would, with a Bible, uh, with your phone, with a pad, uh, whatever you want, what you're going to use, uh, take a look at Luke chapter 24. And really we are going to, for the most part, camp out right here. And, and I hope as well uh, as I did before. Um, oh, by the way, special welcome to those of you uh, meeting us online. The uh, Bible sheet is always available on our website, faithinjeffcity.org, faithinjeffcity.org, and uh, follow that along as well. So uh, Luke 24, uh, I want to kind of, I want to put some wrinkles in your brain again today. And uh, there is so much we could talk about with the resurrection, obviously. And, and this is, it's kind of interesting how God's timing uh, kind of lines up. This is the last Sunday of the church year. I mentioned that in the early service this morning uh, because Advent is always the beginning of the church year. So it's always kind of strange. It feels odd that we stop about a month and a half prematurely to the calendar, right? And we're like, oh, this is the last church Sunday. And they're like, are we not meeting for a month and a half? You know, <laughs> no, actually, we're going to meet a lot in the next month and a half, which is wonderful. Uh, but this is the last Sunday. So on the last Sunday of the church year, Bible class just happens to be talking about the greatest event uh, in the history of creation, and that is the resurrection. So the first thing I want to highlight, verse 1, let's just follow along if you would. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went, they, being the women, went to the tomb taking spices that they had prepared. So I want to talk about why that is incredible evidence, right? That women 
discovered the tomb empty. Now, there have been books written on this. I, I know it seems like, well, it's just a, a detail. I, I want you to understand how important it is. Now, I also want you to know, ladies, um, I have purposely moved some of the tables back, right? So as I say things about women of the biblical time, I've got space, right? I know where the doors are and so forth. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, in biblical times, women did not have the same validity, authority, uh, support of the community as uh, the men did. In fact, men's testimony in court was worth more than a woman's testimony in court. In fact, it usually took two women to corroborate to equal one man, right? And now that was wrong, okay? So just so you understand, okay? So the, the difference is, so the fact that women were the sole first testimonies that Jesus' tomb is empty, knowing that he was there, right? Because if you know the story, they followed and, and watched where they put him. It was a borrowed tomb uh, and, and so forth. So they knew where he was. Uh, the, the soldiers were guarding him. I mean, it was so obvious where it was. And yet when they come back on Sunday morning, the third day, by the way, uh, somebody asked me this last week, uh, talking about the resurrection, that Jesus was in the tomb three days. Not the way we count it, right? Because you say he was put in there on Good Friday, middle to late afternoon, and rose sometime Sunday morning. You're like, that's hardly 48 hours, okay? But he was in the tomb Friday and Saturday and Sunday. That's how the Jews would have counted the days. So don't let that rattle you. Sometimes we take our Greek, you know, understanding of education, and we impose it upon the Jewish one, and then we kind of go, oh, wait a minute, this is wrong, right? Right? That somehow, you know, Jonah was like, man, I wish I was in here in the Greek method instead of the Jewish one, or not the Greek method, or whatever. So the point is, why is this so important uh, that women are the ones that are still, by the way, in all four Gospels, it mentions that detail. All four, not just Luke. In fact, Luke is the only one that just says they. Now that's not a negative, right? It's just that Luke was written probably after Matthew and Mark and the story has been told and told and told. And so when he's communicating, he's just like, well, you know, they, they, they arrived at the tomb early. And it's not like people kind of going, who are they? Right? Uh, it's certainly not the disciples because as the story goes on, the women go and tell the disciples, hey, the tomb is empty. And they're like, what? And, uh, and race to go see and so forth for themselves. So here's what we see. Why is this account so important? Well, first century world wouldn't allow testimony of women to stand unless it was true. I, I want you to kind of think through that just for a second, kind of walk your way through that. If women's testimony, biblically uh, speaking here, 30, 40 AD, somewhere in there, if this was not acceptable, why would it be included? Because it would be somewhat sabotaging of the story. It's, it's kind of like if, if there was a crime and the, the police show up and they're like, well, who saw this? And a little six-year-old says, I saw everything, right? You're automatically going to go, you're six. Your attention to detail, your understanding of things, it automatically diminishes the truthfulness, the reliability, and so forth. Again, ladies, not true, not accurate, but biblically speaking, that's where they were. And so the fact that it is included in all four Gospels, you got to go, why would you include that? Why not, as a Gospel writer, leave it out? Right? It was testified that Jesus' tomb was empty. Right? Just say that. Leave it vague. And then the disciples show up later on and see it, and the angels and all those things. You're like, hey, resurrection. Why keep that included if you think that it would be something that would detract from the reliability of the story? Here's um, Philip Yancey, who's got a great head of hair, right? He says, that's why I appreciate him. According to all four Gospels, women were the first witnesses of the resurrection, a fact that no conspirator in the first century would have invented. Jewish courts did not even accept the testimony of female witnesses, well needed too, a deliberate cover-up would have put Peter or John or better yet Nicodemus in the spotlight. Not built its case around the reports from women. Since the Gospels were written several decades after the events, the authors had plenty of time to straighten out such an anomaly, unless, of course, they were not concocting a legend but recording the plain facts. Okay, So the fact that they choose something that would have 
in the eyes of people that thought this is a conspiracy story. It's not true. A lot of times the criticisms of uh, of the Bible from people that are outside of the faith are that, well, people made this up. They made up the miracles of Jesus. They made up the resurrection and so forth. Every miracle, uh, bar just a couple, uh, were done in open public where everybody could see it and experience. There was a couple miracles where only his disciples went in, right? The raising of the little girl and, and so forth. But most of the time, so it's kind of hard to argue. The man, two weeks ago we talked about that was lowered through the roof, right? Which is easier to do, forgive his sins or have him uh, heal him? Just so that you know that God is here in your midst, get up and walk. There weren't people sitting there and kind of go, I didn't see anything, right? I know that guy is walking around now. He's been, you know, in a mat his entire life and so forth. That doesn't mean anything to me. Even after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he appeared. Several hundred people witnessed him. The disciples obviously witnessed him because Peter, who was scared of a little girl in the courtyard that she was going to identify him, later on says, I will not deny this Christ that I know. I will not. In fact, you can kill me. I still won't deny it. Well, what changed? Did he just, just get bold and just, even though Jesus is still in the tomb? No, it's because he saw him. He met him. And then Jesus does that really great thing with Peter and he asks him, you know, do you love me uh, three times? And you're establishing that relationship. Um, and he gave him some lunch. And we always love that. <laughs> Verse 13 through 16, follow along. That very day, two of them uh, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were uh, talking with each other about the things that had happened. Now, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, remember how important seeing and witnessing is in Luke's gospel. Okay, remember that Luke is um, uh, Sergeant Friday of sorts. Just the facts, man, right? What are the facts that help us understand? Luke was a an analytical person. We know that he was a physician, so he wasn't a philosopher as much as he was um, a, a fact-driven observer. And so when you see things, he will give details in his gospel that John doesn't tend to, just to give you a difference. Um, Matthew's kind of in the middle, Mark's kind of in the middle too, but Luke, lots of details. And the reason it's details, he wants to paint a picture so you're like, oh, I, I get that, I know that. Names, places, we've talked about in the very beginning of this, five weeks ago now, uh, we talked about how many cities he mentions, kings, rulers, regions. The reason he's doing that is because these are the facts. And, and in fact, um, you could have debunked this because of all the data that's in here. If it's wrong, you'd be able to go back and go, that's not true, right? I shared with you guys before that Simon of Cyrene, uh, who carried Jesus' cross on the way to uh, Golgotha, was pulled out of the crowd to carry it. It says in there, it says that he is the father uh, of Alexander and Rufus. And you kind of go, who cares, right? I mean, I don't, what's the, what, why do we care about the name of his sons? Well, later on in Acts, the early church, you see, guess who two people are there involved heavily in the church? Alexander and Rufus. You think somebody might have asked, wasn't it your dad that got pulled out of the crowd? Yep, he got pulled out of the crowd, carried Jesus' cross. We were there, came into town with him, and yeah, that happened. And, and so you understand that if this wasn't accurate, people would have spoken up. They would have said, that's wrong, right? We can't count on the women's testimony. They weren't there, it wasn't all of them, and, and so forth. And, and yet we see this. So now, that same day, sometimes people forget this, on the road to Emmaus, this is the same day as the resurrection. Right? This is not a week later and, and so forth. So this is, this is live and they're, they're walking to Emmaus and you can imagine what they're talking about. Can you believe what happened? Right? I thought he might have been the Messiah. I heard people say things. I heard stories. Maybe I witnessed things. Maybe these are a couple of people that said, I was, I was out in the wilderness. Remember the bread and the fish? I had some. It's really good. Right? Uh, we saw things. David? I was just going to point out that one of the people on the road to Emmaus was Cleopas. Yeah wife was uh, standing by Mary at the cross. And yep. Jesus said. So they were close. Yeah. They were close, intimately involved. So they were, they were certainly some of his disciples, not the 12, but his disciples that would travel with him, witness these things. So as they walk away, um, now I don't know why they're walking. It doesn't seem they're walking in haste. Maybe they're just going home because they're like, I don't know what else to do. I don't know if you've ever done this at the end of a big event, right? Concert, ball game, graduation, there's, there's that moment where you just kind of go, we're done, <laughs> you know, 
uh, time to go home, I guess, because there's nothing else to do. It wasn't as if Jesus said, um, I'll be right back. <laughs> it wasn't as if he said, here's what you do in the meantime. He told him, he said, I'm, I'm going to be captured. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be killed. And on the third day, I'll rise again. And then that third day thing is just kind of like, I don't know what he means. So it wasn't like they were sitting and kind of going, hey, guys, guess what time it is? It's resurrection time, right? Let's go. Um, so they're they're leaving, right? So, but there, this is such a powerful thing uh, in Emmaus. Now, let me pick up at verse 17 to 24. And he said to them, Jesus said to them, what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named, as David mentioned, Cleopas answered him, are you the, o are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? You can hear his tone. Have you been living under a rock? In, in Jerusalem, do you, how do you not know what's going, the guy that rode in a week ago, place just erupts, he's a rock star, he's throwing people out of the temple, they capture him, they crucify him, and he's dead. How do you not know that, right? And Jesus said to them, what things, right? And I love this, he's always working on us. He's like, why don't you recount it for me? Because there's going to be some things that are going to ring true. And they said to him, well, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found that it was just as the women had said, but said, but him they did not see. So interesting enough that Jesus asks for verbal confirmation or a verbal confession. Tell me what you saw. Tell me what you've experienced. Tell me what you believe. And, and so one of the things I, I often remind us as a congregation when we're together in worship, uh, when we have opportunity to speak the creeds, Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, occasionally Athanasian Creed, it is important for us to say out loud what we believe. When Jesus asked his disciples, he said, who do people say that I am? Not believe who I am, because then you got to go look inside. He says, who do you say? And then he turns it back on them and goes, what about you? Who do you say I am? It is imperative, church, that we say who Jesus is. Can't just walk around this world and just kind of go, I believe in Jesus. Inside. It's all inside. Personal. Right? You don't get to hear that. It's my personal belief. He says, I want you to say it. That's why when we get together as church, not only through the creed are we affirming what it is that we claim to believe, we are also communicating to anybody who's around. If somebody comes into church with you, and it's not a Bible-believing Christian, and they ask you, hey, what do you guys believe here? You can just go, wait a second, it's coming. Right? Here's the creed. It is a statement of our belief. Now, there's a lot in it, right? It kind of comes at us fast, but that is our statement of belief. That's it. I mean, in a pretty big nutshell, but it's in a nutshell. That's what we believe, and, and it's powerful and it's important. Um, so let me just pause here for a second on your worksheet and just say, uh, what do the disciples know so far, right, based on what's happening on the way to Emmaus and so forth? The tomb is empty, and some women claim to have seen angels. That's the news so far, okay? So, so that's the update of, of where they are. So let me, let me kind of break this down a little bit. 25 through 31. Keeps going. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, uh, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us uh, for it is evening and the day is now far spent. Um, so he went in to stay with them. Uh, when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he did a little God thing. He vanished from their sight. Jesus still not revealing his identity, but speaking with authority. He didn't say, guys, it's me, right? Look what he did. 
He opened up the scriptures to them. He taught them, right? He, he revealed the truth of God's word. When, when we come together, we don't just say, God, we trust you. You got to show up. You know, you have to appear in the sanctuary, robes flowing like in Isaiah. You've got to be here. Instead, he says, you know what I've given you? My word. I've given you my spirit. Joyce? So I guess what I'm amazed about is that they didn't recognize him right off the bat. They were kept from recognizing him. So that, that again, Jesus, you know, you think of the number of times. Jesus is never bound by nature. Right. And so even though their eyes worked and their ears worked and they saw him walk up to him, he kept that from them so that he could do this again. So he could spend time going, I want to walk you through what the word teaches. It's guys, it's the reason that um, I want you to know today's sermon. Uh, I, I'm preaching from Jude. Uh, I want you to know I've never preached from Jude before. And that's why I did. Right, The Word of God is there in the little tiny book of Jude. And as I'm looking at the readings and I'm like, well, I've preached on that. I've preached on this. I don't think I've ever preached on Jude. And yet it's God's Word. And, and I want it to be one of those things like, well, let's flip a switch on Jude. Right? Let's see if there's something we can grab onto and learn from. Otherwise, um, once a pastor is at a church for about three years, right? you should just be able to stand up and go, ditto. <laughs> Pass the plate. Right? There's nothing new. It's the word of God, right? We just kind of go, that's, that's the word, right? And yet the reason we get together on a regular basis, the reason we preach and teach every time we get together, because this thing up here is always growing and always wrinkling. We're always gaining insights. The reason we teach our children, we don't just go, learn Jesus loves me. That's really all you need. And that's all we'll do. Instead, we kind of go, I want to teach you more and more and more so that you grow in not only your understanding, but your trust and your dependence on God. It's the reason I pray that you all gather together here in this place and there um, in order to learn more, not just for the sake of knowledge, but understanding and discernment and so forth. And so that we, we learn, um, I, I hope this happens often for you, in what we do on a Sunday and maybe other days too. I hope there are times you kind of go, aha. There should be, right? That's the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Julie? I believe that he veils our eyes mm -hmm. until the moment when we are able or can accept what he has to show. Sure. Himself. Yeah. Could you imagine if God just suddenly said, okay, here's all the knowledge. <laughs> right there. Could you imagine? Right? I mean, can you imagine that happened at baptism? And that's one reason why when we open up our Bible every day and mm -hmm. read it, we go... Yeah, I, I can tell you for me personally, I, I remember the time um, when I was reading one particular Bible story and it's one that everybody knows. And I had probably read it a hundred times, literally a hundred times. And, uh, and I remember just had this aha moment that I had never considered before. And I remember just thanking God. I'm like, so now was the time for me to get that new insight. And it started changing how you think. I hope that happens when we come together. I hope it happens through sermons, through hymns, through Bible readings in church, that there are opportunities for us to have those aha moments. But because of that, like Julie said, there are times where God veils our understanding. You don't need it right now. Okay? That, like, like for me, I, I remember when I was going through college, I went through college, got a biology degree, and uh, there's some pretty technical stuff in biology. I'm glad I didn't know that stuff as a kindergartner. I, my head would have exploded. I had to be able to understand, let me tell you a little bit about genetics, you know, as a kindergartner. No, you learn those things when it's appropriate, when it's timely, when it's necessary. Um, and so as we see this, now, if we go back, um, keep your finger there, go to Luke 22. And I'll ask one of you to read this. Luke 22, 14 through 19. Luke 22, 14 through 19. Would somebody read that? It'll be very familiar. Body, which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. 
All right, very good. We'll stop there. Thank you, Joyce. So this idea of do this in remembrance of me. Guess what he did to the guys in Emmaus when they sat down? When he sat down at table, what did he do? Broke bread. Broke bread. And then what happened? <laughs> they remembered. Right? When, when we say that, this is not simply a theological reality. Right? When we come forward and, and receive the bread, and I say that in those words of institution, you know, do this in remembrance of me. You're like, well, I'm supposed to just recall that Jesus died for me. You're supposed to recall that he is the very bread of life, that he gave himself. That remembrance connects us to that 2,000 year ago sacrifice and that celebration of the resurrection, even before that in the Old Testament of God providing manna, that remembrance is saying, take the history of God and his people and so forth, that promise culminating in Christ and remember it and be awed by it. Not just as a trivial fact. That's not what faith is. Now, facts are, are bricks. Right? And, and, and God takes those bricks and he builds a foundation, right? So we've got to know things, right? You, you, you ought to be familiar with the word of God and his commands and so forth. That's not what saves us. Understanding that God through the Holy Spirit constructs those facts, those details, that information into something that is meaningful, right? And so knowing things and teaching things is important, but we have to be able to see it built so that we kind of say, this is what um, girds me up. This is what holds me up, stands me up. So this do in, do in, in remembrance of me is critical to understanding why Christ did that. And it goes even further than that, right? In order for the disciples, this next spot, in order for the disciples to actually see the risen Christ, why was he suddenly um, recognizable to him? This is the interesting thing. Um, I, had, uh, I had this really strange... Uh, circumstance. I, I forget where we were. Chris and I were in a restaurant. It wasn't in town here. I, we were traveling somewhere. And, um, and I, I'm sorry, I just thought about this just now. And, uh, and I remember looking at somebody a couple tables over and, and having one of those really awkward moments where I'm just staring at them. And I'm like, I think I know them. And then, you know, kind of, Chris, do we know that person? She's kind of doing this, you know, try, she tries to be subtle. And that's, that's a good thing. Was it Culver's? It was Culver's here. Yeah, we frequent Culver's here, don't we? And um, anyhow, so we were, that's right. I was thinking it was longer ago than that. Um, and we're, I'm just staring. I'm like, man, I think I know them, right? I, boy, there's something that's a little different and, and, and older or whatever, but something was off. And I was just like, I think I know them. Until something was said. And then you go, aha, right? There was this aha moment. Oh, that's who you get up and we're all jovial and friendly and just kind of aha. But I was looking at him the whole time, weird, right? And strange, but, but I, you know, and, and you could see they were starting to get uncomfortable. <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, I'm doing this and kind of, I don't know, there's something familiar about you. And so, you know, you can imagine they're sitting down with him and he's like, and he's like, oh, could you pass me the bread? Sure, yeah, pass you the bread. Take and eat. And they're like, ding. And, and like David said, these were these guys were there, right? They were intimately involved with Jesus. And suddenly there's this aha moment. They're like, it's him. And, and you notice Jesus, that's all he wanted. I just want you to recognize me. See ya, <laughs> right? This goes, he's like, that's, my goal is not to, to do this here in this gathering. Instead, my goal was just to let you know I'm risen. That was the whole point, right? The resurrection is the goal. It was not to teach more, he will, but it was not, that was not the purpose to be able to say, oh, I got some few things I want to add, right? Or some other things I want you to experience. No, the, the goal was, it happened. It's done. I'm back, right? And, and all that that means. So when we think about this, two things happens. In order for the disciples to actually see the risen Christ, needed two things. Scriptures explain to them, because that's what he does on the road to Emmaus. It's also what he does when he appeared to the disciples, when Thomas wasn't there and then was there. He recounted again. Remember what I told you? This was going to happen. Remember that? That's the word, right? And, and reminds us, why, why did Jesus so often, when somebody would have a question or a problem with somebody, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, quoting the scriptures again. He wasn't just standing up as some religious radical that was pushing back against the, unfortunately, off the trail Jewish faith. 
But instead, he kind of goes, let me draw your attention back to the Old Testament. It actually is all you needed to know that I was coming and to recognize me. But you kind of got off track. Right? You, you kind of said, oh, we're the chosen people of God, which means we don't care about the Gentiles. I mean, we got to be obedient. We got a bunch of rules. In fact, 600 more that we got to follow in order to make God happy and so forth. And he's like, mm, let's wheel you back in here a little bit and then be able to go, truly, truly, I say to you, this is what the word of God says. Follow this. So the scriptures explain to them is one. And the other thing is bread. Bread to remind them. Now, I want you to think of those two things. And I want you to think about what we do every single Sunday that we come together, right? When somebody would ask you what we do as a church, you can name two things, word and the sacraments. That's what we do to come together as church. That's only come together as church, not to come together and do church. We're church. It's a building. But when we come together as church, those are the two things that we practice almost every single time, word and the sacraments. Because those are the two things that Jesus demonstrated to be able to say, here's what points to the resurrection. This is what points to the culmination of everything that I've set out to do. When we gather as church, the two things we do focus on word and sacrament. In fact, that's my call. As a pastor, you've called me to say you are going to oversee and carry out word and sacrament ministry. That's it. Mostly. And then there's visiting and things like that. But both of those and engage in that, right? We can get off kilter. This is not a, a commentary on this. We can get off kilter on a church when those two things start to get lost. When we're like, we want to be more about this. We want to be more about that. We ought to spend our time doing this. And we start dividing time away from the two things that Jesus used to demonstrate this is how you know that I am the Messiah. This is how you know that the task, the deed is done. And, and so that word and sacrament ministry. Um, go back to uh, go back to uh, to chapter twenty four. If you're not already there, and verse uh, thirty six through forty three. Let me just read this for you. This is where Jesus appears to his disciples, and as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them, said to them. By the way, uh, before I go on, the the two individuals on the road to Emmaus, uh, right after Jesus vanished, they pick up and they run back. Right, even though it's getting late in the day, and obviously it's not safe to travel at night out there. There's not street lights. Um, there weren't police. So uh, traveling the roads in, in a Roman-occupied area, uh, there was a lot of people looking to make a buck, and uh, there was robbers and thieves on things on roads. And, uh, and this is far enough out to where it would have been several miles. And they uh, hoof it back because they can't wait to tell the disciples who they saw. Right, As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and they thought they saw a spirit. And they said to him, uh, and he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do your doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, uh, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh, bones as you, uh, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they, were, uh, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before them. So um, what do they need, right? He shows up in their presence, just to be clear. Um, the first thing, got to explain the word. Listen to verse 44 through 45. Then he said to him, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ must suffer. Oh, sorry, I went too far. Um, Christ must suffer many things. So the word is explained. When he sits down with them, he demonstrates, he says, you know what you need? You need to be reminded. Reminded of what the word of God says, right? So the word needs to be explained. In 46 and 47, as I started reading, he said, thus it is written that the Christ must suffer on the third day rise from the dead and the repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name of all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So the word is explained and the mission of the church is shared. Now, when you and I receive the sacraments, that is the beginning of the mission of God's church. Baptism, you're brought into the family of God. Um, you are given the gift of faith for one purpose and one purpose only. Well, two, but, but one essential one. 
to share, right? I, I've often said this about you here. If you all are gathered here today, and those of you online, if you are a believer in Jesus, you cannot get any more saved, okay? We're not working at being extra saved or newly improved saved or saved 2.0, right? If you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're saved. You hang on to that. That's what saves you. God's not going to get there and kind of go, well, oh, 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 too bad, right? <laughs> not saved enough, okay? You believe in Jesus, that's it. So that gift that you received in, in baptism, if, if the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, providing that fruit, you're saved, okay? Now, it doesn't mean I take that casually, but sometimes we spend a lot of energy trying to say, I got to be more saved. I'm trying to, trying to raise the curve, so to speak, right? Instead, you kind of go, I'm safe. So what? So what now? I've told you this over and over and over again. You are still here for a purpose, and that is to share that faith with other people. That's the mission of the church. It's why you were given faith. When you take that Lord's Supper, do you know what it's meant to strengthen in you? Your mission. Every week when we come together, do you know that Jesus died and rose again for the forgiveness of your sins? That's what we participate in in the Lord's Supper. Do you know why we participate in that? So that you will be fueled for the mission. It is not just for you to be more saved. Don't come away from the rail and just kind of go, oh, thank you for saving me and leave it there. You can start there. Lord, thank you for saving me. Now use me as I take from today, empty out hell and populate heaven. Let me do that. Let me do something that is disproportionate to who I am, that you would do something even greater than I am capable of doing in my own self and my own ability. 48 and 49, let me try to wrap it up here. Uh, you are the witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. We are not left alone to accomplish this mission. I think one of the mistakes that we often make as Christians is we become overwhelmed and we're like, oh, reaching people that don't know Jesus. Oh, they're so bad, right? They're so evil or they're so lost or they're so argumentative or they just hate me or hate us as Christians. And oh, I just can't do it. It's not you, right? Our job is to be obedient. Our job is to be a vessel. Our job is to be able to go, God, use me. Now, it doesn't mean, I don't believe that it means for you to stand on a street corner with a big sandwich board that says the end is near, repent. I don't think that's effective, right? Now, uh, one out of a thousand may come by and kind of go, I'd, I'd like to know what the problem is, okay? I was talking to somebody about this just the other day. We were talking about evangelism. I don't think knocking on doors in a neighborhood is effective anymore. I don't think we like people on our front porch. Isn't that strange, right? I remember growing up, if somebody knocked on our door, everything stops, Mom put the Sanka on, got the little tiny Edelman's cake, and kind of, come on in, tell us what's going on, right? Sit down. You guys, are, I'm dating myself, I know, right? <laughs> Some of you are kind of going, yep, yeah, that's the way it was. Now, somebody knocks on your door, all the lights go down, you start doing the crawl across the living room. <sighs> Just be quiet. They'll go away any minute now. Mom, it's the pizza guy. No, just ignore him, he'll go away. See, we're not left alone. God's given us the Holy Spirit for that very purpose, right? So the significance of the resurrection. Why was the resurrection necessary? Okay, now I know you're thinking, well, of course it's necessary. We needed to be saved. The resurrection is the guarantee that death has been defeated. The one thing that came into this world because of sin. Adam and Eve were never going to die. They were going to be immortal, right? They were never going to die. Death was not in the equation. Once they sin, the wages of sin is death. That's where death comes. Today, to this day, guys, people don't die because of cancer. They don't die because of war or starvation or disease. They die because of sin. Now, those things are all symptoms of sin, but that's the reason death exists today. It's not like Adam and Eve brought cancer into creation. We eventually find some treatments and some help for that. What he let in was sin, brokenness. Right? There's a dysfunction in creation that is everywhere. But when that resurrection, he overcomes death. He overcomes sin because he died a sinner's death, but being sinless. And Satan didn't win. So when we talk about victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil, that's why the resurrection is necessary. Otherwise, you and I are going to contend with those three things. Sin, death, and the power of Satan. The reason you could say, Satan, go away. 
The reason you could say, God, forgive me. My sin doesn't count for me anymore because of Jesus. That's because of the resurrection. Not because you're strong. Not because you're like, I believe. And somehow that gives you power. You can because Jesus walked out of his tomb. The resurrection means everything for us. This is what it's all about. So the resurrection is a guarantee that God has not lied, that God has kept all his promises. In fact, in Genesis 3, 15, let me just close with this today. Genesis 3, 15, listen to what it says. This is the, the uh, verdict of God. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God said at that point, he said, there is going to be a break in creation and Satan, it's your fault. And it's going to be caused by you and initiated by you and so forth. But when Jesus came and defeated Satan, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. I'm not necessarily recommending it, um, but The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Um, a gut-wrenching movie to be sure. I remember my wife and I saw it. Um, actually, it was in Indianapolis. I'm looking at her, but she's gone. Um, <laughs> She's up shaking hands and greeting people. But um, we were in Indianapolis at a conference, and uh, so I'll, I'll talk about her now. Um, my wife has, a, I think, an unhealthy um, uh, attachment to Mel Gibson. Right? <laughs> now, I, I get it, right? I get it. But they, this was going to be um, the movie. Uh, was not released yet. It was still in, uh, in editing form. But they were going to show it at this big Christian gathering in, in Indianapolis. And there was, I don't know, 15, 20,000 people there. It was at the, the uh, uh, Lucas Oil uh, Convocation Center next to the arena there in Indianapolis. And um, word had gotten out that Mel Gibson was going to show up and, and kind of premiere you know, and, and introduce it and so forth. So my wife uh, and me stood outside the doors of the arena where it was going to show four hours before it started. And um, she was disappointed, but I was not, that Mel Gibson didn't actually show up. <laughs> but he did come on the screen as kind of this, hey, welcome to you at this gathering and so forth. I can't be with you because we're still in studio making last minute changes. But anyway, we watched this film for the first time, and it is gut-wrenching to watch the, the physicality, the suffering uh, of that. And, it, and it's relatively, I, I can speak to this, I think, uh, of what I've learned over the, the years and so forth, accurate to what he probably endured to a point um, and so forth. But there's this one moment where when Jesus actually gives up his spirit, the character that plays Satan, there's this cry of dereliction, there's this cry of agony, because at that point, Jesus won. Even though it was that, that definitive death you know, the, the, the earthquake and the curtain in the temple tears and everything's just haywire. And yet, and then Satan, it just streams out away from this creepy looking Satan character. And he just screams out because he's like, I lost. And that to me, it just gives me goosebumps even now to think about it. Because like, that's what Jesus accomplished, right, in this. He didn't lie, kept his promise. He did it perfectly. And because of the resurrection, uh, you and I have life eternal with God available to us. All right. It is good to learn. Uh, it is good to be exposed to the word of God. Um, but it's for a purpose. And that purpose is to be a light, is to be salt in this world, to empty out hell and populate heaven. And uh, so next week, we're going to put some... Uh, uh, we're going to put some muscle behind that. So we're going to do some apologetic work and look at some specific things to help you and me uh, be able to go out into this world and be able to talk to people, um, not argue with them, not debate them. I, I made that mistake when I was younger. I'm like, I can just boss people into heaven, right? I can just sit there and kind of go, you're dumb. You don't know anything. I'm so smart and I'll prove it to you. And, and what a silly way to evangelize. Um, maybe a good way to win an argument, but then you don't win anything. Uh, anyhow, we'll start on that next week. Let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your passion uh, because in that week uh, where you endured so much and then culminates into that moment of your death and most importantly, your resurrection, uh, you kept every promise. You didn't lie. Uh, and in that moment, you changed creation. So Lord, may we not only thank you and relish that gift, but use it. Um, God, these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.